We talk about CR's investigation into engine issues of the Honda CRV, drive the new Nissan Altima, and answer your questions next on Talking Cars. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Mike Quincy. I'm Jennifer Stockberger. And I'm John Lincove. So there's been a lot of chatter these days about what's going on with the Honda CRV, specifically a lot of engine and drivability issues, which kind of leads us to also one of our many questions that we'd be getting from our great audience about this car. Mm -hmm. This is coming from Dave, who writes, the Honda CRV has always been a top rated reliable SUV, but the ninth generation has a well-documented issue of oil dilution, which Honda seems to have no fix for. Every owner's form is polluted with complaints. There's a class action lawsuit, and China has halted sales of the model. What can you share about this, whether or not this vehicle is still okay to buy? So, this is involved uh, also uh, Consumer Reports' own reporters. The great Jeff Plunges wrote a piece for mm -hmm. Consumer Reports Online about this issue. And uh, it mostly has to do with the 2017 to 2018 CRV with a 1.5 liter turbo engine. So, um, John, can you take us through what is going on with this car? Yeah, sure. Basically, it, it started with, like the gentleman said, internet complaints, but also a recall in China of hundreds of thousands of CRVs, which we should note has a different engine than the one that's sold in the United States. It's right. slightly different. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the oil, uh, if fuel and, and oil were mixing in the engine, and that's not obviously what not you good. want. <laughs> um, particularly, Honda said in colder climates, though from our research we saw that they, it was happening in warm climates. It was happening not just in yeah, Minnesota and isolated. New York, but it, you know, it was in warmer climates that aren't going to have the same cold weather starting issues. Now, Honda says it's, it's, uh, it's working on a solution. Um, they say that it's not nearly as widespread as you hear on the internet. And you know, in some ways, yes, because forums will blow up with people attacking, you know, attacking it and saying there's a problem. And you still think Honda sold a couple hundred thousand of those already in the United States. So it may be a small issue, but it's still an issue for owners. Right. All right, so, 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 so with this going on with such a popular model, uh, you know, being Consumer Reports, we're always saying, what can right. you as a consumer do? What, what advice do you have for the owners of this car? Right, so, so certainly this is not a recall. So um, you're not gonna get that letter that says, hey, you got something with your car, go get it fixed. So it's, you, the onus is gonna be on the owners to bring their car if they feel they're having this issue. So, um, couple of things you could do. One, check your oil. Um, you know, a lot of people may not even do that frequently, but do that because often when the fuel gets into the oil, it registers as an overfill in your oil level. Mm -hmm. So do that. If you're smelling fuel, that's in a lot of the complaints, people are smelling mm -hmm. fuel. That may be an indication. And are you having some drivability issues, stalling, you know, not not starting well, particularly if it's cold. You're not getting Is your heat, heat not, not working? Heat, yeah. Right, it manifests in a number of different ways. You know, and you mentioned, if I can jump in, uh, yep. the stalling issue, because it, that is a safety issue right. in our mind. Right. And if you're driving along stalling, that's it's dangerous. That's so scary. instead of being a, a technical service bolt and that's sent out to dealers, and like you said, the onus is the owner to come in and ask about it, it should be something that they receive in the mail because it is really a safety issue. And, that, and that's, and that's a, a real important po point because in Jeff Plunges' article, you know, they said this is not being touted as a safety Correct. issue, which means by law, Honda does not have to uh, necessarily take action on this. Right. So I would say, in addition to making those checks or, or, you know, winter's coming, you may not even be experiencing it. But if you do, take the time to register, particularly if you're having stalling issues or real drivability issues, go to safercar.gov, which is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration website, and register the complaint. If there's enough of them, it may alter how Honda feels they need to handle this. It may ultimately become a recall. But in the meantime, onus is on you. Bring your car in. Honda's saying in our, our investigation that they're promising some level of fix. In November-ish. Yes, November-ish right. time frame. Take it to the dealer. Tell them you're having the problem. Because Advocate for yourself to get it fixed. Because the early fixes were, well, just change your oil every thousand miles. Right. That, that is not a not fix. Not or, 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 or take your car a on a longer fix. highway drive or something like that to right, get it more right. up to operating speed. I mean, what's, what kind of baffles me a little bit about is, is, is according to Consumer Reports article, is Honda devised a recall plan for the car in China about a month after Honda owners right. deluged the company with complaints. Deluged, so to your point, yeah. 
It's get a get online, get on Honda from, from, a, from a dealer level, from a corporate level, get organized as owners right. and say, you know, you've you got to do something about this. Right. One thing to note, recall laws are different in China than they are in the United States. Right. So people are using this as an excuse. Well, they recalled a 300,000. There needs to be one now. You can't use right. it's not European regulations, Chinese regulations as justification in the United States. But it, do, it should raise also an alarm with the manufacturer. Right. And because they were so quiet mm -hmm. on this, <laughs> yeah. that's what, what really irks, chatter, irks right. owners. You right. know, because they bought a, new, a car that's new, a lot of money. One owner told us that he had to trade it in on a RAV4 and took a $7,000 hit on that. Right. In the big picture of the number of CRVs that have been sold, it is small. It's mm -hmm. still small, despite the chatter. I think we had nine reports in our reliability data, but we have thousands of CRVs in right. that data. Right. So it is still small even though there's, it's, a couple there's a lot of chatter, a lot of talk about it. It's still relatively few vehicles for the number of CRVs they've sold. And Honda says it will probably have a fix uh, for the problem uh, through a product update campaign or a warranty extension. Right. So um, keep on top of this if you're a CRV owner. And yeah. if you're looking to buy one, wait till the 19s are out because they said whatever recall right. will be, or whatever, sorry. Whatever fix, fix will be included. <laughs> will we'll, we'll be on the 19s, which Before aren't in, which aren't delivered sale. yet, right. aren't maybe not even right. production. So wait for 19. Yep. Okay. You know, if you have your heart set on it. Yeah. So that's kind of our advice on the CRV, which uh, takes us to our next segment, which is what we're driving here at the track. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the car the car du jour is uh, the <laughs> Nissan Altima. This yeah. is completely redesigned for 2019. The big news is that uh, the Subaru Legacy is not the only game in town if you're looking for a mainstream sedan with all-wheel drive. Uh, the V6 engine is gone. And John, you've, you've driven the car. Uh, what do you, you know, what do you, what's your take so far? Yeah, so the one that they, that, that we rented from Nissan, when they, they right. sent to us to rent, <laughs> is uh, the base engine. Uh, so it's front-wheel drive. Um, it, it's a fine sedan. Um, you know, I'm not going to make a judgment on their trim level that they sent, you know, all of that. It drives nicely. It's roomy. Um, it has some things that I'm not a fan of. Very sloped windshield and, and lower roof. So it's a little bit of a challenge for me to find a comfort. I sit a little more upright. Um, but also in the sense of getting to see over the cowl and over the hood and park, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're fighting this, okay, head in the ceiling to see, or are you sitting lower and now you don't have the same visibility. Um, you know, but like you said, all-wheel drive uh, available on the Ford That's Fusion, nice. standard on the Legacy. So it is a, um, it, it's positioning them as a little unique in the segment, even though it's a, it's a, a dropping segment mm -hmm. because SUVs are things that people want. Honda, Honda CRV <laughs> <Right>. category, <laughs> right. you know, in particular, Small SUVs. you know, yeah. the, the same size uh, vehicle. Um, they sell sell hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these overall. So. Yeah, this is this is a popular vehicle. Yeah, I mean. yeah. I I kind of liked it. I found it very straightforward. We have so many complicated. It has a traditional gear shifter. I found the controls very easy to navigate. You talked about roominess. Part of my day is loading up mostly most days two, sometimes three 14 year old boys and taking them to high school every morning. And it is a great judgment of the roominess of a car because they got backpacks and yeah. they're getting big. And it was fine for three 14 year old boys this morning. How about the horses? You know, yeah, I did put the horses in, but the 14 year old boys. And, and you mentioned a lot of uh, standard safety equipment. Well, that's the other jump is they've made forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking, all standard. Uh, I, I, found so the, I found the handling Pretty good. Yeah, it I was like impressed. It, it, it held on pretty good yep. in the corners on our mm -hmm. track. Uh, decent steering feedback. Uh, and you whatnot, said it's the base so. engine. I was plenty happy with yeah, it. Yeah. So a little CVT, yeah. CVT ness. It does shift, but yeah. if you really are accelerating on the highway, it just. And I say, you know, Nissan. You know, they aren't the, the Camrys and the Accords. Yeah. There might be a better deal to be had there. A great way to get all the safety at a more reasonable price. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, but it's gonna. Potentially, will have a depreciation greater, so it won't hold its value over time. True. Depending um, how long you keep it. Maybe it's a it. car you, know, you keep. Well, if you're not going to resale it, yeah. maybe that's not right. such a thing, but yeah. Right. And and you mentioned the CVT, and as we know, the people that we work with <laughs> here at Consumer Reports Auto Track, yeah. we have very mixed feelings about right. CVT. Right. Normal, dri it normal driving, right. it's, it's pretty unobtrusive. Right. right. It's, it doesn't have the, the rubber band feeling of oh. like, oh, and launching you forward. Right. But if you're into it, if you're in it, you know it's not a 
right, traditional, traditional. Mm -hmm. six, seven speed automatic. Well, the Altima is, has usually been a pretty competitive model in Consumer Reports testing, so we're going to buy our own test model and we'll know more Stay as we, we put the miles on. Right. Yep. right. Which leads us, of course, to our next segment, which is always one of our favorites. And that's when we take your questions. Uh, we love them. Keep them coming. Please uh, send everything, videos, uh, text messages to talkingcars at iCloud.com. And I think everyone who hosts this messes that up, but we'll go with that. No, just you. <laughs> I think Monticello messes <laughs> it up kidding, once in a while. Uh, anyway. So it's a mic in. What you're <laughs> we love the mics. <laughs> okay, so um, the first is a, uh, a video question. This one is, is from uh, Leo. And um, let's roll. I have a question about the automatic transmission. That is, should we put the car in neutral while we stop in front of a stopping light? Well, I do that before because I think that may release the stress of the transmission from the engine. But I heard a lot of people talking on the internet saying that, oh, we shouldn't do that because that may cause an increasing in wear and tear on the transmission. Should we do that or should we just leave the car in drive and hold the brake pedal? So, sort of interesting question. Jen, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for Leo? Yes, so I, again, had my own thoughts, but then I inquired of our mechanic, John, to confirm. And Big John. Big John, our, our lead mechanic. <laughs> and his answer was, leave it alone. You don't need to shift to neutral at that very low idle speed at a stop that the torque converter is just kind of sitting there, you know, floating was the, was the word he mm -hmm. used, doing very little. Actually, the additional shift would um, probably be more wear and tear than just sitting there letting it float. So I mean, you, leave you, it alone. It's a physically clunking into gear, you know, right. depending on the transmission. Right. Back and forth. It's also a safety issue. Right, you know, and that's lot, the other thing he talked about. A lot about. of people you remember? Will, will get, you know, they'll, they'll kind of get lazy. You know, you're on a flat surface. Oh, now I don't have to keep my foot on the brake. The car isn't doing that creep. Okay, so you don't have your foot on the brake. The car's in neutral and someone hits you from behind. You're launching into the intersection, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Or the light changes. And you you put it in you go you go <laughs> and it revs and then it's it's sort of like you know you forget to put it in gear and you just drop the clutch right right uh, you know and someone hits you from behind it's it, it's not worth the trade off it's right. just yeah, not worth what not, you're giving up or putting yourself sense. in yeah, and, and your brake lights aren't on if your foot's off and that's a good point as well so. and, and it's funny because because when I I listened to to Leo's question. I had to kind of back it up and listen to it again because I thought he was talking about a manual transmission. Yes, yeah. Because back in the day, we used to you have a discussion. When, when you come up to a stoplight with a manual, do you, do you just keep your foot in the clutch or do you put it in neutral yeah. and, and all that? So that's, that's really what I thought it was all about. Anyway, great question. Thanks so much. Uh, keep them coming. Uh, we got another video question, this time from Peter, about over-the-air updates. I uh, remember the episode a while ago where you had uh, tested the uh, Tesla braking system and found that uh, the braking distances were larger than expected. You called Tesla and uh, they updated the software and pushed it out over the air just a couple of days later. The thought that uh, a car um, safety operating system can be accessed over the air to me is a huge risk. But, you know, don't you think it would be much better if the uh, operating systems and the safety critical software uh, were compartmented, isolated, and not accessible externally? So, John, Tesla, over-the-air updates. What, what are your thoughts? Is, is this kind of nervousness, paranoia justif justified? Um, I think it's pretty cool that Tesla was able to fix the brake braking issue over that. Um, I, I don't think that we're going to see a lot of that with manufacturers immediately. Um, you know, Tesla almost builds like a different car on a regular basis with their over-the-air updates. You know, you're, you're <laughs> constantly getting getting changes. You know, one of the things that, that we've talked about is, you know, they, they keep the Model S. It looks the same except for the weird nose, but a lot of it's the same, and they just keep making modifications over the air. Um, going to safety, going to worry. Yeah, you know, you don't want to be a, the beta tester, the guinea pig in the sense of, oh, I got, I got an update. Now I'm going to drive down the road. Oh, my gosh, it didn't take, you know, right. because I think, Jen, you've said it doesn't always work on your phone or it bricks. You know, it doesn't <laughs> always work on your computer, right? And yeah. you're kind of relying I, I on think, your brakes as a I safety issue. I think the issue. good thing is that Peter's talking about it. Tesla's talking about it. Other manufacturers who have done over-the-air updates, mind you, for slightly lesser things than braking. But I think because it's on people's radar, that's a great thing. The privacy part of it and the hacking risk part of it are absolutely on Consumer Reports' radar. 
and manufacturer's radar. So that's great. I do think it's going to be a balance of benefit versus risk. I mean, we, t we just talked about recalls. If there could be a recall that's just a push mm -hmm. and everybody gets it, you don't have to take you your to envelope to the dealer. Done, yeah. It just Schedule gets done. Time. Particularly for safety-related mm -hmm. things. If right. that could happen without the risk of, of someone else being able to alter your vehicle, that's a great thing. And that's the ultimate goal in terms of safety where we'd like I to I think be. you want to make sure, you know, the, the big worry is the validation of the code. Right. You know? and, and, and as you said yesterday, you know, you're, you're bringing the car anyway to the dealer and it's, and it's often you're plugging into their computer mm -hmm. and you're hoping that, that all that is, is still coming, kind of coming sure. over the air from the manufacturers sure. anyway. And look, Chrysler had an update over the air for the, their infotainment system mm -hmm. and it bricked. Mm -hmm. And right. they had to send another one to right. unbrick it. Not a safety issue. Not a safety but, right. issue, but, yeah. as, but a, you, climate control doesn't work. Right. Your navigation system right. doesn't work, you know, and, and you're getting up the next morning. Okay, start of a trip. Nothing. Now what? Yeah. Right. As right. more and more stuff gets moved into those infotainment screens, that right. risk. And, and this is probably something we're going to be seeing more in the future. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I so. think so. Tus Brave Tus new world. On the, on the cutting edge of this one. Yeah. So Great. To, to Peter, justified in your bit of hesitation, but I think that you're asking and people are talking about yeah. it. It's great. great question, Peter. Thanks so much for your submission. Uh, the next and sadly, the last question <laughs> is from Carrie, who writes, love the show. I currently drive a BMW 3 Series wagon. I know I'm supposed to want an SUV. Why? I loved this question. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. Because it's such, it's all people talk about. It's all people are buying. Um, I don't know. I mean, John, should you should you just should you just automatically want an SUV? Well, no. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you That's should right. automatically the want is anything you're unless not supposed to <laughs> yeah, necessarily unless want you're it. a lemming, you're following all the other you know lemmings over the cliff. Um, you want? I mean, look, some of it's some of it is style. Some of it is keeping up the Joneses. You know, some of it is that is it chicken and egg? Are the manufacturers offering something that people are rushing to? or people telling manufacturers that they want this. Mm -hmm. Wagon sales are pretty limited to a couple of the Germans and Subaru, you know, true wagon right. Right. Uh, with the Outback. Um, in many cases, the wagon doesn't have the same storage capacity. I think of the Audi All Road, mm -hmm. Q5 is much roomier, you know, somewhere a platform, and that was previous generation. Okay, because the, right. you know, let's just talk about when they, when they, are, they are introduced. Um, you know, the All Road was, was not as, as functional in cargo area. Um, you know, I do like wagons in the sense I, I owned an Audi A4 1.8T uh, turbo. Um, I like putting roof racks on it and not having to stand on something to put the bike up there. You know, it's, you don't have to buy an SUV, yes. but you're forced into it in some ways about what's available for sale. Right. I mean, and, and John's, John makes a good point. I mean, is it, is it the market... Just telling manufacturers what it's 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 what people are buying, it's what people it are asking for. Yep. But I mean, I know that we we like we like wagons a we lot. Like, you, you I, I think Germans. for us, there's a little retro there right. that we have well, wagons. The, the, but the, I the still Regal, like the them. Regal Torx wagon, yep. for example. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I had a fondness for that. Yeah, and I personally, I find some of particularly the luxury brands like BMW a little too squatty to me. They take a lot of the advantages with of the, with their, small their SUVs. SUVs away, right. Yeah, right. which to me. Visibility, access height, cargo height. Those are, the, to me, the biggest advantages. Some of the smaller luxury brands, you don't get all of that. Mm -hmm. You don't get all that. So I'm a wagon fan. I would say, Carrie, be a trend breaker. Get a wagon. Yeah. And you can find it in the parking yeah. lot. It's easier to find in a parking lot. Right. Yes. And, and, and it's <laughs> hidden by an SUV, but it doesn't look like every other yeah. lemming mobile. And right. I, I tend to find that people buy more vehicle than they need. They, they think they need all-wheel drive and, you know, they, they probably hardly ever drive in snow. They right. think they need mm -hmm. a massive truck to pull a tiny trailer and they really don't. Uh, I know families in the town that I live in, they have like one kid, but, oh, we have to have a Toyota Land Cruiser. And, you know, so, I mean, <laughs> well, I, that's a little different. My wife, we, you know, we had one child and then we had a, we have two kids now, six and eight, and she wanted an, a, a, you know, three-row SUV. And yep. we don't really pop that third row up much except when we visit relatives or have yeah. someone visit it's it's not often right. and it's not even because i get to have cars from from work and get to drive our test cars we just don't use it yeah yep. yeah so, so uh great question uh keep the faith of cars uh <laughs> forget suv no, i mean it's what obviously is what people are buying right. so that's the way it goes anyway that's about all the time we have for today's episode uh thanks so much for tuning in if, uh, if you want to learn more about the topics 
or the vehicles that we talked about, check out the show notes. Keep those questions coming through Talking, Clar Talking Cars. I did it again. <laughs> Talking Cars at iCloud.com. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.